This episode is sponsored by REN, a website with a monthly subscription that helps fund projects to combat the climate crisis. Click the link in the description to learn more about how you can make a monthly contribution to support projects like rainforest protection programs. One of Jupiter's most recognizable features is its alternating red and white stripes. But since their first appearance in early telescopes, astronomers have only been able to study them from the outside. And this made it hard to tease out their three-dimensional structure. Like, are they essentially just a thin layer of paint on the planet's surface, or only the tip of an atmospheric iceberg extending deep below? Well, thanks to NASA's Juno spacecraft, their true nature is finally becoming clear. In a paper published last week in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets, a team of Juno researchers probed Jupiter Jupiter's atmosphere to a depth of more than 250 kilometers. And what they learned raised some new questions. The key instrument for this research was Juno's microwave radiometer, which measures the intensity of microwaves produced by molecules in Jupiter's atmosphere. The instrument is made of six channels, each of which is sensitive to radio emissions at a different wavelength. And ultimately, each of those wavelengths corresponds to activity at a different atmospheric depth, ranging from the top of Jupiter's clouds to 250 kilometers down. When the team pointed this instrument at the planet's stripes, they immediately saw a pattern. At the surface, the redder stripes, called belts, were bright, glowing with microwave emission. But the whiter stripes, which are called zones, were dark, indicating a lack of emission. And as they looked deeper into the planet, this pattern persisted for a bit, but then it suddenly reversed. At higher than 10 bars of pressure, which is the standard way of describing depth on Jupiter, the zones appeared to be emitting microwaves, and the belts were dark. The authors called the transition region the Jovicline, an analogy with the thermocline region of Earth's oceans, where seawater switches from being mostly warm to mostly cool. And they identified two possible mechanisms that could cause it, each of which would teach us something about how Jupiter's interior works. The first idea is that the regions of low emission are caused by Ammonia. Ammonia strongly absorbs microwaves, so if there's a lot of it in a belt or zone, it would stop any emission from reaching Juno. Jupiter also has giant rotating cells of air in its atmosphere. And if the cells are oriented so that the ammonia is in the zones near the surface, but not in the belts deeper down, it could reproduce the pattern seen by Juno. The other idea is that the changes in microwave emission are related to changes in the atmosphere's temperature. The general idea is that closer to the surface, the zones are cooler and the belts are warmer, so the belts give off more microwaves. But if you go deep enough, they switch, with the zones becoming warmer for some reason. In reality, both effects are probably at play to some degree, and might be why the brightness is variable. But if scientists can figure out which one is dominant, that could help them understand more than just what's going on with the stripes. It could also help them understand the atmosphere's winds deep inside the planet. In fact, the author's calculations indicate that the change in the wind speed with depth could be 50 times greater in the temperature scenario than in the ammonia. One. Unfortunately, Juno's observations aren't enough to differentiate between the hypotheses, but it is an exciting start that points the way for future exploration. And that is sometimes how science works. No one mission can answer all the questions, and nowhere is that clearer than in NASA's Mars Exploration Program. Like a paper published this week in the journal Nature Astronomy describing a new technique to find organic molecules in Mars' soil. It is one more step in our search for life on Mars. Over the course of two decades, NASA has followed a slow but steady plan to use rovers in its search for life on the Red Planet. First was the Pathfinder mission and its Sojourner rover that proved that driving on the surface of Mars was something that you could do. Then came the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, who found evidence that water once flowed on Mars' surface. After that was Curiosity, who's looking for organic molecules. These are molecules containing carbon that are crucial for life as we know it, so finding them suggests that life could have maybe evolved somewhere. And now we've got Perseverance, who, for the first time, is looking for the actual evidence of life. But even though Perseverance and its helicopter ingenuity might be garnering all the attention, Curiosity's work has not stopped. And that's where this new paper comes in. It reports on the result of an experiment carried out by Curiosity in 2017 that tested the technique of derivatization. That's the process of using a chemical reaction to change a molecule you want to study into something that's easier to work with. It's an everyday process for chemists in the lab, 
but it had never been tried before on a spacecraft. Curiosity used the technique to better process polar molecules, or molecules with a different electric charge on one side than the other. Specifically, it used chemical reactions to add more atoms to these polar molecules so that the tech on board the rover could identify them more easily. Key building blocks of life are polar, such as some amino acids, so it's an experiment with real-world application on Mars. While the experiment didn't turn up any amino acids in the Martian soil, it did find other organic compounds, although they're still working to figure out where all of them came from. Maybe more importantly, though, they proved that derivatization can work in a spaceflight context. That's the kind of step forward that NASA's Mars program has been built on. And who knows? Maybe it's just the advance that Perseverance needs to find that first evidence of extraterrestrial life. And if you would like to help advance the fight against the climate crisis, you should check out today's sponsor, REN. They are a website with a monthly subscription that helps to fund projects to combat the climate crisis. REN searches around the globe for projects that have the biggest potential, getting data on the ground to track their impact over time. Which would not be possible without your support. Over the long term, we need governments to fund these projects, but we can start by crowdfunding them. And as a bonus, we've partnered with REN to protect an extra 10 acres of rainforest for the first 100 people who sign up using our link in the description. And as always, thank you for supporting SciShow Space.